It's good to be with you this evening, and we trust that the Lord will speak to us through His Word. We're going to turn together in Mark's Gospel, if you have a Bible with you. Uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 8. Now, I see there's a few folk here that were over at the mission I was helping in an Anhor, so bad news for you. You're going to hear the same sermon twice. So uh, if you took notes, you'll not have to take notes tonight because it'll be the same thing. But I really feel that it's the right message for tonight, and um, I sense that God does want to speak to someone here tonight concerning the very issue that Amanda has been singing about just there now. So we're going to read just one verse of Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, and verse 36. And the Word of God says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world? and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Let's bow together in prayer, please. Our Father, we thank you for the record of Holy Scripture. We thank you, Lord, for the accuracy and the permanency, Lord, of your word. We thank you, Father, that heaven and earth, generations will pass away. Men's opinions will rise and fall. Kingdoms will come and go. But the word of God abideth forever. Amen. And we thank you, Lord, that we have the eternal word of the living God. And I pray, Lord, as we listen and as we look at your word, that God the Holy Spirit will take the truths of the word and apply them savingly to our hearts. We pray, Lord, for every need that is here tonight, and we ask that you would work by your Spirit, drawing men and women to yourself. No man can come except the Father draw him. So we pray for that drawing supernatural power that brings people to the Lord. Father, I give myself to you, claiming your cleansing and sanctifying power. I take authority in Jesus' name over every influence and power of darkness, and every false spirit that would be in contradiction to the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, you would put a wall of fire round about us and grant your presence here in the midst. Now, loving Father, I ask for the anointing and empowering of the Holy Spirit, and I pray that in all things Jesus would be glorified. For his name's sake, amen and amen. Many years ago, a man was leaving uh, the States to go over, or rather leaving uh, England to go over to the States. He sold all his possessions and he invested them in one diamond. It was very valuable, obviously, and he put it safely in a little bag and tucked it in his pocket. As he started on the journey, he wouldn't look at it or take it out, lest anyone would see it or contemplate stealing it. But as time went on, he began to take it out and look at it and let others look at it as well, and he got more and more familiar with it. As the days went by on the journey, he began to become a little less concerned of its safety, and his familiarity led him to throw it in the air and catch it. And of course, he did this with regularity and always caught it. And uh, people said to him, are you not a little bit concerned about that diamond that you have that you're throwing? He said, no, no, it's, it's safe enough. He said, I, I'll always catch it. He said, I know what it's worth, and I'll always catch it. And one day when the ship was traveling, he, in front of everyone, threw it up, way up into the air, and, and reached out to catch it. And just at that moment, a rogue wave uh, hit the side of the ship, and the ship went to the side. And as he reached out, he couldn't get to the gem, and it fell down deep into the depths of the ocean. He cried in despair, it's lost, it's lost. I've lost everything. I've lost everything. The Lord Jesus said, what shall it profit you if you gain the whole world and you lose your own soul? Or what shall you give in exchange for your soul? The Bible makes it very clear concerning this text and if we spoke on this text, these three points alone, it would probably be sufficient. The first one is very simple, and you don't need to be intelligent to grasp what the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is saying. First of all, Jesus makes no bones about it that you and I have an eternal soul. That's the first thing that Jesus says in the text. 
So that means, friends, that the thinking of today, the thinking that we gather and accumulate from television, from media, that most of it is actually lies. We are being inoculated to truth by lies. And of course, the Bible says that the devil is a liar. He was from the beginning. The Bible tells us that the whole world lieth in the lap of the evil one. We're told by so-called professionals or uh, scientists or people who are educated that the earth came from a big bang. An explosion took place somewhere in the past, and from that explosion came perfect precision order that from that explosion, whether it was millions or billions or beyond, nobody's certain, but they're just pretty certain that it was a bang. They're not sure what was there to make the bang happen. They're not sure what existed to actually bang together to make a big bang. They're not sure about any of those things, but what they're pretty sure is that there's a big bang. And from that, we eventually evolved. It sounds logical enough. To the person who does not engage their mind or use their intellect, then it could be plausible and acceptable. But when you begin to use the little gray matter in between the ears, you discover very soon there are major problems. You see, dear friends, the problems are that those who are telling us this are only men. At best, they're maybe 80 years of age, How do they know something's a hundred million or a hundred billion years ago? They know as much as we do concerning the past, because they have no facts, no facts, whatever, to stipulate their truth. So when they say that there was a big bang and the earth evolved and so on and so forth, there is no facts to stipulate or to, to guarantee that to society. It is a belief system. It is a faith system. Atheism and evolution is not scientific. It is a religion. It is a belief system based on what people want to believe. Just as Christianity is a belief system on the same facts that are presented. Now, I'll illustrate it for you, and I trust in a way that you can understand. But if I told you or you heard that... There was a bomb. I said, there's a bomb in Moy tonight, and uh, the Moy Church of Ireland Church in the center of the town has been blown up. There's been a bomb, and you decided to go past. I'm sure you would. Curiosity would bring you down to see, is the tower still standing? Is the, what's it like around the church? I'm sure you would have in your mind some kind of idea as to what the Church of Ireland would look like if there was a bomb placed inside the church. Now, if I told you that the bomb had taken place, and if you go down, there's now a fish and chip shop, and they're selling chips from where the bomb took place, that the bomb exploded, and from the explosion, a fish and chip shop was born. And all the stones fell in perfect order, and all the wood in the church that were in the pews fell down together and formed a a, a kind of an area for walking and an area for to set the till. And now there's a beautiful fish and chip shop after the bomb. I wonder, would you laugh at me? Well, that's exactly what I'm told to believe about evolution, that from this massive explosion came perfect order. Common sense tells me, being brought up in Northern Ireland, that when there is an explosion, there is chaos. Everything goes wrong. Everything goes out of sync. Everything goes into chaos, not order. But the amazing thing about this world and about you and I and about the universe is this fact that everything works in precision order. Everything to the very hundred years from now, you can tell exactly where Venus, Neptune, Saturn, you can tell exactly where they'll be. You can predict because it's all in perfect order. So you see, friends, it takes a lot less faith to be a Christian than to be an evolutionist. The gray matter in between 
tells me so simply there has to be a creator. And that's why God says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. God says the only, the only, the only order I can place on a man who declares there's no God, God says, I, I don't want to articulate about it. I don't want to get into the whole physics of it. He says the man's a fool. That's what God says. Well, we can't improve on what God says, can we? If a man says that, he's a fool. The Lord Jesus said that we are not from a big bang or evolution, but we have an eternal soul that will live as long as God lives. And the moment you were conceived in your mother's womb, God inserted an eternal spirit, and that part in you is going to live as long as God lives. The good news is you're going to live forever. That's the good news. The bad news is that you might live in the wrong place forever. That's the bad news. You see, not only did Jesus say we have a soul, but he said that it's extremely valuable. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So if you take all the riches of the world and put them all on one side of the scale, all the gold reserves, all the, the uh, stock exchange, all the mineral reserves, take everything from every country and put it all on one scale, and you put the soul of an individual on the other, God says the soul will outvalue it all. You're very valuable to God. You're very valuable to God. God who made, you, who made you loves you. He made you in your mother's womb. He formed you. You're very precious to him. You may not know him. You may not love him. You may not have received him, but he's in pursuit of you. And he loves you despite the fact that he knows everything about you, and he knows the things that you don't even like about yourself, and still he loves you. And you'll never find anyone in this life who will treat you the way God will treat you. You'll never find anybody as forgiving as God. You'll never find anybody as patient as God. Not even your mom or dad or your closest friend. I say none of them will treat you the way God treats you, because God is love. Your soul is very valuable. But listen, friends, Jesus said you have a soul. Jesus said your soul is extremely valuable, but here's the worrying aspect. He said, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Jesus said you could lose your soul. Now, I know today that people say if you talk about hell or talk about judgment, I mean, people don't like to think about that. And to be honest with you, I don't like thinking about it either. I don't like thinking about what hell's like. I don't like, I, I watched a, a video recently. I uh, looked at uh, an instance of a lady over in America and back in the 1970s, she had this very unique experience. Now, I don't know whether it was literal. I, you know, there are things that supernaturally happen to people, and sometimes they're hard to explain. But for a month, she said that every night, the Lord would come to her in her bedroom, and he would take her. Now, whether it was in a dream or a vision or literal, I, I just don't know. I don't know. But nevertheless, she said that she was brought to view what hell was like. She wasn't in it in the sense of being cast in it. And the video lasted for approximately 40 minutes. And I have to tell you that I didn't sleep that night after I watched what that lady had to say. And in detail, she described some of the events and things that happened in that place called hell, which she believed, and I've, I'm probably of the same opinion, that hell is in the center of the earth. Now, that's controversial. But I do believe that it's most probable that it is in the center of this earth, that she actually discovered there were, there were locations where spirits ascend and descend, places on the earth where the spirits go into hell and places where spirits come out of hell onto the earth. So, yeah, where, where's that in the Bible? Well, it says in the last days, in the book of Revelation, you remember the Lord said he would open the pit and the locusts, the demons would come out like locusts out on the earth, they'd come out of it, it was very disturbing. And what made it more disturbing was not the fact that she told the story, but was, it was to think that there are so many people that I know and knew who are already there. They never knew the Lord. They never knew the Lord. You see, Jesus said you could lose your soul. 
What did he mean? Well, he didn't mean you can drop out somewhere. Or he didn't mean, not, you know, the, the, in theatre that the, the, the doctor would pull it out and forget to put it in again. To lose your soul meant that your soul would be lost eternally when you would die. It would be lost. In fact, dear friends, to be absolutely specific, you don't have to die to lose it. You can lose it while you're here on earth. If you commit the unpardonable sin, you've already lost it. Your soul's already gone. You're just waiting for die, to die for it to happen. Jesus said you could lose your soul. Now listen, don't listen to what a preacher from up the road says. I wouldn't encourage you no more to listen to me, but I would encourage you to read the Bible. I would encourage you to, to get the brain cells working. Why is it you don't think about these things? Well, I'll tell you why many people don't think, and there's a very simple biblical explanation. The devil has blinded the mind. That's where the devil works, the mind of the unconverted. He doesn't, he doesn't work primarily on the body, but the mind. It's amazing how people think. People can be so intelligent, so wise on so many dimensions, and when it comes to spiritual issues, they are so dumb. They don't engage their mind. And there's a reason for that. It's because the devil has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel, who is the image of God, should shine in. You see, the devil doesn't want people to receive the light of the gospel. He doesn't want them to understand how they stand with God. He doesn't want them to hear that the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, came in the form of a man, that he lived a sinless life, that he died a substitutionary death. That is, he took our place on the cross so that God could forgive us, righteously forgive us for the sins that we had committed. The devil doesn't want you or me to know that. Well, let's, let's conclude, for our time's near gone. Why do people lose their souls? I mean, there has to be an explanation. If you lose your soul, there has to be an explanation. I mean, if I could open hell tonight, which I obviously can't, but I could bring out different people, and, and what that lady said in that tape, now I don't take my doctrines from what a lady says on the tape, but what she said was everything that she did say was completely consistent with the Scripture. That's what I found very interesting about it. it was con she just elaborated a little on different points. Uh, and you know, the Bible says, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Uh, and she shared of how she went to different places, different locations, because the Bible tells us that hell has different departments. There's a department called Tartarus, for example, in the book of Peter, and that's where fallen angels are reserved. They're kept in chains. They're never let free. They're waiting for the judgment. But she said it was different departments all down through this place called hell. And she said she went down one particular route, and she said there were people who had lived very immoral lives, very immoral, sexually impure. And they had given their lives to all forms of sexual impurity. And she said they were chained together in a fire, burning. It was very alarming. I'm just telling you one little bit. But you see, the Bible says, whatsoever a man soweth, and what you live for, whatever is your God here on earth, when you die, you will still worship that. You will still long for that. Th that will never die. That, that longing inside you for sin will never be fed. It will be, it will be driven in hell, but never satisfied. Because it is true, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So why do people lose their soul? Well, first of all, very quickly, because of foolishness. Foolishness. I've already mentioned the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. People are foolish. You remember the man, the rich farmer, that he stood one day and said, I, 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 I've built barns, and he knocked down one farm, built another, and this guy was doing well. I mean, he was financially at the top. This guy owned property. He owned this, that, and the other. There was no shortage to, and there's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. I mean, Jesus never condemned him for having wealth. 
There's nothing wrong with wealth. It's, 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 whether, it's whether it takes possession of you. That's the problem. Whether it becomes your God, that's the danger. But he, he had wealth, and he, he had done everything, and everybody would have thought, this guy has arrived. He has made it. He's got the best car. He's got the best tractor. He's got the biggest farm. He's buying land. And, you know, to the eyes of the world, this guy had made it. But God came down over that man, and this is what God said to that man that day, thou fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee, then who shall these things be? You see, friends, he wasn't a fool because he had made money. He was a fool because he had no time for God. And God said, you know, you're going to be taken from them. Tonight your soul will be required. Can I say in a loving manner to you, I'm not here to be rude or crude. I just want to alert you. I want to use the authority of God's word to, to rec because I recognize we're all dying. And we're all going to die. And the old must die, but the young may die. And I want to alert you to the fact that, friend, you have an eternal soul that Jesus gave you, that God wants to be with him in heaven, that God wants you to enjoy all the blessings he ever created as your creator. But you must decide. You must decide. He was a fool. Some people lose their soul because of foolishness. Some people lose their soul because of ignorance. Ignorance. You see, the Bible says there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It seems right to go to church and do good. It seems right to be religious and sing in the choir and do your best and do your neighbor no harm. And if there's trouble in the community, to be there to help, to read your Bible, to say your prayers, to do good things, and to feel good about yourself, that you are a good member of society. That seems good. But the Bible says there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And you see, so many people, sadly, will lose their souls and already have, and many will lose through the terrible, terrible delusion of religion. Religion. Religion is probably the greatest weapon that Satan has used in the damnation of millions and millions of souls. Amen. The religious people are always the hardest people to talk to. The most devoted to works and labors and so on, always the hardest to reach. Ignorance will cause you to lose your soul foolishness, but finally stubbornness. Stubbornness. You see, there are people that God speaks to. There are people who do sense they understand the truth of the gospel. Maybe they've been nurtured in it from birth. Maybe they've gone along to a good church where they, they heard that the Lord Jesus loved them and came and died for them, and they have received that light. But because of their own personal love for sin, because of their desire and ambitions to do their own thing, because of the power of the devil over their lives, they will not choose the Lord. It doesn't it seem strange that people actually have a difficulty in choosing to follow Jesus? That seems strange. Does that in itself not indicate there's something wrong with us? We actually have a problem with receiving Jesus actually have a difficulty. Like I remember before I was converted hearing the gospel, and there was this big wrestling match going on about receiving Jesus, the light of the world, receiving the Creator into my heart, receiving uh, all the blessings of an eternal God, and the assurance that when I died I would be in heaven, and the consciousness of His, His presence with me every day on this earth, and then at the end of the journey that He promised He would take me safely over the river of death and into His presence. And yet I had a problem in receiving Him. <laughs> that shows you what, what we're like. That shows you the sin nature. The sin nature. There is something in us all that hates God. There's something in us all that would dethrone and murder God if we got the chance, because we want our own way. If you go out to the average person today in society that lives in a beautiful home, nice car, everything's running well for them, and you say to them about receiving Jesus Christ, they, they, they don't want to hear it. 
And why do they not want to? Because they have already their own kingdom set up. They have their own gods. They have their own way of living. And they don't want God or Jesus to interrupt. And ideally, what they would love to do is they would love to get to the throne of God and murder God and do him in and have their own kingdom go on forever. Such is the nature of man. Man's not getting better. I had an alliance candidate come to see me looking for my vote recently. And uh, strange enough, he was a Christian, which I thought was a bit strange, to be honest with you. But he came in, and he was a nice chap, but he had some weird ideas, I can tell you. But my dear friends, he started to tell me, you know, I think the world's getting a little bit better. <laughs> well, he did mention a few things, I suppose, that there was slight improvement here and there on a few issues. but. I said to him, I can't really agree with you on that. I, I just think that man, as the Bible says, man is a fallen sinner, and man is a falling sinner. Man is always going downward, and the more sin you commit in your life, the more bound you become by sin, and the more sin you need to satisfy the appetite for sin. That's why my son asked me last week, we were driving home, and he said, Dad, why do people not live 900 anymore? I thought, that's an interesting question. Maybe he wanted me to live to 900. I never got asking him that. I'm sure he didn't. But uh, I said, well, there's a, there's a problem with man. And he says, well, what is it? I says, well, man was so depraved. He lived 900 years, and the problem with man was not only that he could go down into the depths of sin for 900 years and explore sin and develop sin and get to know the devil pretty well in his lifestyle, what he did was he passed it on. He passed the information to the next generations. And what happened was, because he lived so long, sin spread like a virus. And so God said, I, I want man to continue to live, but he can't live living that length because he'll destroy the earth with sin. And what God says, I'm going to shorten his lifespan. And that's why we live shorter. It's the goodness of God that lets us live as long as we do. It's his goodness. See, dear friends, some people don't come to the Lord because of stubbornness. And maybe you're there tonight. Say, well, God has been speaking to me, Alan. He's been talking to me about my soul. What would I need to do? Well, very briefly, when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, and Brian has mentioned it tonight in testimony, and it's not something you can switch on. Please don't get it into your mind that you'll get saved when you want. Don't you get it into your mind? Well, you know, at some stage, you mean it's 10 past 8 now, half past 8, I'll call on the Lord and get saved. You see, friends, that's one of the delusions. I've talked about the delusions of religion, but one of the delusions within the church, the true church, is this thing that you can just call on God at any moment and I'll get saved and say we prayer before I die and I mean it'll all be all right. It's not, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. You and I are dependent on God. He's not dependent on us. And he says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. I'll not always speak to you. You see, God speaks by His Spirit. And when God's speaking to you, you'll know it. You'll know it. You'll be aware of it. You'll know there's a voice, and it's the voice of a divine being speaking to you. You'll know that. And what God will speak to you about is your sin. God will speak to you about eternity. God will speak to you about, about meeting Him. He'll speak to you about the cross of His Son. The big issues of life, God will speak to you about them. Now, it's not pleasant when it happens, but it's wonderful when it happens because it's the means of your eternal salvation. It's the means of you ultimately being in heaven. I didn't enjoy when God spoke to me about my sin, but I'm so glad he did. I'm so glad he did. You see, the Spirit of God will strive with you, and you will be given the option, the choice to decide. The Bible tells us about individuals who, who came to the Lord Jesus. Some of them responded and repented of their sin. Others didn't. Some decided that they would follow the Lord. Others said they wouldn't. And, and, and your soul's destiny is in your power. God will speak to you, but you have to decide. God never coerced anybody to heaven. I mean, like, imagine uh, the day I was married, if I had went into the, to church and somebody hold my arm up my back and say, you, I mean, you've got to go through with this. You know, nobody gets married like that. 
you make a free choice. You say, I'm choosing to be with this person. I'm going to live with them as long as, as, long as we're alive. This, this is my partner for life. That's in, this, in like manner, on a spiritual level, that's what it's like. You're coming to the Lord, and you say, I'm, I'm, I'm choosing to give myself to this person. I'm choosing to, to go into a relationship with this person. This person will be my God, my, fo- my Savior, my Lord, and I will follow him the, all the days of my life. That's my choice. And I'm going to turn away from all sin. You say, but, but Alan, listen, there's sins in my life that are going on. Nobody knows about them. If my mom or dad knew, if my granny knew, or if my brothers or sister, they'd be, I mean, I would be so embarrassed. Yeah, absolutely. Because the thing about it is, friends, listen, we're all sinners. I have had people come to me in my study sometimes, and they tell me, oh, I'm really embarrassed about what I'm going to say. I mean, I'm not a Roman Catholic priest. I don't want to hear people's sins. I have enough of my own. But sometimes people can get help. The Bible says, confess your faults to one another. Sometimes people can get help. And I have had people come, and they've shared really what what to them, and they are bad things. And they've shared them. Did I think any worse of them? No. Because I know that that potential for that sin is in my heart. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that Jesus' blood washed away all my sin. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how evil you are. I don't care how dark you are. I want to tell you tonight that Jesus Christ loves you, that God in heaven loves you, and he longs to save you, and he doesn't want to spoil your life. He doesn't want to destroy your life. He wants to bless you. He wants you to know him. He wants you to find the purpose for which you exist but you must choose to repent and receive him. The Bible says, as many as received him, Jesus, to them God gave the power to become the sons of God. You'll never know the power of God to save. You'll never know anything of his grace or his mercy until you take the step and you say, Lord Jesus, I come as a repentant sinner to you. I come with all my heart to you. And I want rid of my sin. I want to receive you, and I want to live for you the rest of my life. I haven't the power to do it. I don't know what it all involves. But Jesus says, when you come to him, he said, I will give you the power, and you'll experience it. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Many years ago, a Danish businessman, he was a rank atheist, died. He left his possessions all in the hands of a solicitor. The solicitor, when they got together, they read the will to the family. The family were very disappointed because they weren't mentioned. And the solicitor said, or the solicitor said that in the man's will, this multimillionaire, he had left all his possessions to the devil. It was a joke. <laughs> it was the final kick at Christians. It was the final laughter. It was the final spittle at God. This Danish businessman, I leave all my possessions to the devil. The solicitors looked at one another and said, how do we do this? And one of them suggested, we do nothing. We just let it all go. And they agreed. Do you know, friends, what you have to do to lose your soul? Nothing. You can leave your soul to the devil by doing nothing. Now, there's some of you here tonight, and I probably don't know you, some of you, and you're not a Christian. And some of you I'll probably not ever meet again. That's most probable, too. But I want you to remember something, and, and the meeting is over, I promise you. I want you to remember something. Listen to me carefully. If you never see me again or hear me again, that won't really matter. But I want you to remember this. 
that there was a preacher who came and told you not to lose your soul. That God forbid that you should die and waken up in that place that that woman mentioned. You will not be able to say to God, I never knew. (coughs) Nobody told me. Because I have a fear too, you know, as a Christian and as a preacher. And I'll tell you what my fear is. When I get to heaven, that there would be people who would be in hell who had sat under my ministry and to go out and say he never told us. That would be an awful thing. I have tried my level best tonight to speak to your heart. And I trust that you'll come to Jesus. Let's bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the truth of your word. We thank you for the testimony. We thank you for words and song. We pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to speak to people, that you will draw them to yourself. And Lord, that you will bring them to your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.